<laughs> Everybody to mute. If you'd like to stay tuned. Wait, 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 wait. wait. He's gonna mute it. And we're not allowing participants to unmute. Yeah. Okay. So yes, um, maybe Sina can post an email, um, email address for those who want to stay tuned. Today's class will be a bit different uh, than usual. This is a tribute to someone whose thoughts and leadership had such an impact on all our lives. Rabbi Lord Zaks was of course so greatly admired and respected and so much has been said about him since his untimely passing, but we thought it would be appropriate to dedicate a class to exploring one of his books, Non in God's Name, which he published five or six years ago. Although our primary focus here is on Torah Sefarad, we of course integrate all branches of Torah, wisdom, intelligent, thought-provoking Judaism. Having said that, there is no doubt Rabbi Sachs was very much an embodiment of that classical Sefaradi ideal in which Torah and science are natural partners. And of course, the notion of accepting the truth, whatever its source, is a motto so representative of our approach. And that again is another principle Rabbi Sachs championed and practiced like, like nobody else. So very appropriate and, and definitely within our remit. So this is Leilu Nishmat Rachamim ben Eliyahu and Rabbi Sachs as well, Yaakov Tzvi ben David Arya. So just before I open up the conversation to our esteemed panel, I have to say I'm, I'm really excited that this book was chosen because when I was in Yeshiva in Yerushalayim, I attended the book launch of Not In God's Name, which took place in the great synagogue um, in, on King George where he discussed the different themes of the book. He was in conversation with Daniel Taub, the former ambassador of Israel to the United Kingdom. And I don't know if it's what encouraged me personally to pursue a, a politics degree at university, but it definitely did help shape my outlook on, on politics, philosophy, and, and even quite a few of my essays on, in university on extremism, totalitarianism. So that's my personal connection to this powerful work. Um, feel free to pop your questions in the chat box during the discussion and at the end we'll try address a couple. Um, okay, so, so let's kick off. I, I think before we start to unpack some of the core ideas, perhaps Rabbi Dweck, you'd like to give us a very brief summary of Not in God's Name. You know, for those who haven't read it or those not entirely familiar with it, what's the book about? What's the central thesis? What's the objective Rabbi Sachs sets to achieve? Thank you, Avi. And uh, always a kavod to be able to have a discussion and, and to speak with Rabbi Kada. Um, the book was written by Rabbi Sachs as a result of years of crimes, murders, terrorism that was occurring by religious groups, religious motives. And the, he felt that there was a tremendous amount of confusion around that. Uh, and he was right that there was a tremendous amount of confusion around that because people were seeing ostensibly very religious people uh, engage in acts of violence and murder uh, and terrorism in God's name. And Rabbi Sachs clearly felt that it was a responsibility of his as a religious and moral leader to be able to set the record straight and to put forth that this is not what religion is about. And what, it's not an easy book to write, right? I mean, you know, Rabbi Sachs definitely was taking a formidable challenge because on the surface, not only does it look like uh, religious people have been engaged in violence throughout history, the texts look like they may very well encourage violence. And so Rabbi Sachs wrote this book in order to be able to create a framework through which we can look at the violence and the, uh, I would say, evil that we, we witnessed, do witness, have witnessed, in God, performed in God's name, to set a framework to re redefine that and to be able to see the broader, the broader ideas that we tend to forget when we are shocked with these kinds of things that we see in the world. And so um, I'm not going to go through the details of the book. I really do believe that people should read the book in order to be able to gain the details. But that is the premise of the book. That is what Rabbi Sachs was aiming to do. I remember uh, in 2015, when the book had just recently come out, and I was, um, as a president of the Council of Christians and Jews, I, we were meeting at Lambeth Palace with the Archbishop 
Archbishop Welby, uh, on the issue of extremism and terrorism and violence that's occurring in, um, in the name of religion, in the name of God. And Rabbi Sachs not only spoke there, but the, gift, the book was given out as a gift <laughs> at, at Lambeth Palace. So that's how important uh, the book was uh, seen and is seen, not only by Jewish people, by, but uh, by you know, religious people around the world. And so that, that's what Rabbi Sachs set out to do. And it certainly is not of me to say, but I can say at least from my own perspective, it's a masterful job. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's marvelous as well that he has like a universal message and at the same time he can talk to, you know, with Torah insights and thoughts. And I think what we'll do is jump right into one of the points you said. Um, in the final chapters, in fact, he, he, he talks about hard texts. Um, again, how passages in Tanakh, and he obviously talks about the Quran and in the New Testament can easily be used to whip up violence and, and hatred and and he writes in chapter 12, I've got a quote, fundamentalism, understanding texts without interpretation is an act of violence against tradition. So Rabbi Kada, could you elaborate on the role humans play in interpreting the Torah, the role of Midrash more generally? When do we take things literally? When not to? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Avi, for the introduction. And likewise, Rabbi Dweck, it's always a pleasure to share a platform with yourself. Um, and to discuss this very important work. That is a very interesting chapter. That quote is a very powerful one, which you just said, that uh, it's an act of violence, taking our Torah and interpreting it without any, applying it without any interpretation. That essentially is an act of violence. And Rabbi Sachs is very honest in this chapter. He admits that there are hard texts. There are passages in the Torah which make us uncomfortable. Any rational thinking person feels uncomfortable. Um, we feel that these are perhaps not, it's not so much applicable to the modern world which we live in. But that's what Torah is about. Torah is about interpretation. And in fact, he quotes the famous Gemara in Kiddushin. The Gemara says, Kol ha-metargem pasuk etzurato hareze badai which means if you take a pasuk and you translate it word for word without any context, without any uh, interpretation, you just give a translation of it, then you're a liar, essentially. Because the Torah, true, the Torah has a simple understanding, a simple meaning, but there's a whole context of the, of the verses. And you can't just take a sentence that you must kill the apostles and then interpret and then apply that without any interpretation. And he calls this fundamentalism, he calls this impatience with the whole process, right? He says, going straight from revelation to application without interpretation, that's fundamentalism. There's an impatience. You don't have the time to sit down to try to interpret, to try to understand. Let's, let's try to see the intertextuality between the Pesukim. Perhaps there's another message here. Just to go straight in, this is the problem. And this says Rabbi Sachs, quoting Pascal, this is when men can do altruistic evil. The beautiful quote, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction, right? When we do violence from religious conviction, that's done cheerfully, that's done completely. Um, and Rabbi Sachs goes a great length to try to show that actually these texts, a lot of them today are no longer operable, at least from the Torah. Um, first, he tries to show that the underlying message of the Torah is shalom, it is peace. Indeed, this is the prophecy of Ishaya later on, that Loisa goy herever herev, we'll no longer have to pick up a sword against one another. And he also quotes the Gemara. The Gemara has a discussion between Rabbi Eliezer and Hachamim, whether you're allowed to carry a sword, whether you have to carry any weapon in the Shut HaRabim, in a public domain on Shabbat. Because on the one hand, we're not allowed to carry. On the other hand, we are allowed to uh, wear our clothes because it's considered part of us. So is a weapon considered a beged, which you're allowed to, uh, uh, to go out to the public domain on Shabbat? Or is it considered a masoi, a burden? Tanakama, hachamim hold, that it's considered a burden because that's not meant to be. Sometimes we need to use our swords. Sometimes we need to use our weapons, but it's not 
part of our begadim. It's not part of our essence. Not, you can't compare that to our clothes. Yes, there are instructions to wage battle against Canaan. Um, there are instructions to wage battle against other uh, countries. But the opinion of the Rambam wasn't shared by all Rishonim, we do have to admit. The opinion of the Rambam, at least, was that we always have a command, even against Amalek, to try to make peace at first. The, all the instructions in Torah to wage war and to wage battle against Canaan, against Amalek, these are only if they don't accept Shalom. If they accept Shalom, then Milchama, war is forbidden. Yes, there is a commandment to blot out Amalek, which we're going to read on Purim in a couple of weeks' time. But, as the Gemara Brachot tells us, when Sancherev came and he uh, mixed up all the nations, then this is no longer operable because we no longer know who is Amalek seed and who, who isn't Amalek seed. Who, so therefore, these seemingly difficult texts, perhaps in the 21st century immoral ones, um, are no longer operable and therefore that, it, that shouldn't be an issue. At the end of the day though, you know, after reading this chapter, you still feel a kind of, I did at least, and I'd be interested to hear what Rabbi Drex has to say about this. Um, you still feel at the end of the day that, yes, okay, these things are no longer operable. Uh, they're no longer applicable for technical reasons. We don't know how Malek is. We don't know, you know, we have to make peace and these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, wiping out a nation, that's a difficult thing to stomach. And for me, the only way I can, I can grasp these, these concepts is to recognize that the Torah was written in a certain context. Just like the Rambam writes in the context of Korbanot, that really sacrifices isn't an ideal, right? Sacrifices is a concession. The Kadosh Baruch Hu recognizes human psychology, recognizes that we need to worship something physical, and if sacri sacrifices weren't allowed in some context, then we would end up serving Abu Dazara. And so God says, look, okay, I can't outlaw everything. I'm not going to outlaw uh, sacrifices. I'm just going to tell Abu Dazara, stay away. You want to bring a sacrifice? Bring it to the Beit HaMikdash. The same thing I understand is slavery, right? We just, this week's parasha, beginning of the parasha, laws on slavery. And these are difficult to stomach. We don't want to return, the West doesn't want to return to, uh, you know, to slavery. But, there is a concept here that, look, to outlaw slavery completely 3,300 years ago wouldn't be possible. It's just too much to ask from human beings at that time, at that stage in history. And so Akadosh Baruch says, fine, you want to have a slave? Okay, have one. But you need to know that you need to adhere to these laws, like the Gemara tells us. You and Eved, you acquire a slave, it's as if you've acquired a don more. You've acquired, there's so many rules, it's as if, if you've acquired a master for yourself. So, okay, I can't outlaw it totally, says God. But look, Let's give some rules and regulations. And I think the same has to be said with regards to the difficult pieces, with regards to wars, that well, Kadash Baruch Hu is saying, look, you know, obviously this isn't an ideal. And it's going to take Yeshaya later on to tell us, Lois Agoy her for sure. Now we're not, we're not currently yet there at that situation. Now, at the very least, try to make shalom. You can't make shalom, and the way to go forward in the current circumstances is to wage war and you have to kill. Um, many don't like this approach because it contextualizes the Torah, but that's the reality of the Torah. The Torah was given for a certain generation. Yes, it has to be reinterpreted for the generation we live in. But that's, that's one way out of uh, hard texts for me. Um, and I'll just we'll say one final point is that it's very interesting to contrast this with um, his whole part two. In part two, he gives very close readings of the text. In the stories of Esav and Ishmael, the stories of uh, uh, Yaakov and Yitzhak and Yosef and his brothers, a very close reading of the Pesukim. And it's interesting to contrast. On the one hand, later on, he's telling us that, you know, you have to try to reinterpret these verses. On the other hand, in order to get around the issue of sibling rivalry, which we'll talk about, he sticks to a very close reading of the text. And what he says is something beautifully. He says that we need to train a generation, and we, yeah, we need to train a generation of religious leaders and educators who embrace the world in its diversity 
and sacred texts in their maximal generosity. And so there is this tension. On the one hand, you know, some texts have to be uh, reinterpreted. On the other hand, some are meant to be taken literally. And you need to approach the text with maximal generosity in order to make the correct balance. Rabbi Dweck, do you want to add, or shall we move on? I'll, I'll say to that that, you know, Rabbi Sachs writes in the book, war is normal. And it's very important to understand that. There's a very big difference between war and terrorism and uh, the defining of, of other individuals who are not us as evil and, you know, going on holy war against them. It's important to recognize that the Torah is speaking to a nation and it is a national question as to how it is that this nation wages war. Um, and war is not going away anytime soon. That is the way that human beings have to deal with each other. As much as we hate it, as much as it's something that we don't, we wish in our dreams wouldn't be, it is part of the natural world. And it always has been. And it's important to understand, by the way, that, that that's part of evolution. I mean, all of evolution is essentially an arms race. And people forget that. So this is not a question of war. This, this book is not addressing war. It's addressing waging a, an attack on others because they are not religious enough, not the right religion, or not God-fearing enough, which is essentially what the, you know, the idea is. And that, for all intents and purposes, is not spoken about uh, in Torah. We can get into a discussion as to why, you know, why that is or why I think that that is, but I don't think that it is. Uh, and what Rabbi Sachs, I think one of the important things, I know that we're going to discuss this afterwards, or this may be the next thing that you, you, you want to discuss. You know, I don't think it's so much a matter of contextualizing uh, in the sense of the period that the Torah was written. Of course, you know, we always have to recognize that Torah was written in a specific period and spoken a specific language to a specific people. But it is nonetheless filled with principles that are meant to be seen, learned throughout the generations. And also, you know, it's, the way that Rabbi Sachs talks about the interpretation as being, uh, you know, a process, that is true. But there's another thing that's involved, and that is there is, there is a natural framework through which a reader reads a text. In other words, there is a mindset through which a reader reads a text. And the text of the Torah was given to a very specific people to be read in a very specific mindset that didn't require a tremendous amount of work. It was just a matter of perspective, a matter of mindset. And it was not meant to be read by other people. And it was not meant to be read outside of that mindset. So even if it was read by other people, it would be recognized that reading it in some kind of foreign mindset was a failure of a reading of the text. And that's the case with any text. It's the case with any text. There is an expectation that the reader is coming to it from a particular framework and mindset. And I think the, to recognize that is essential, in being able to understand the language of the Torah, the approach of the Torah, the way that, that, that the, the ideas of the Torah were meant to be seen and understood. And why am I saying that? Not just to say it, because part of, part of the dealing with this is in how it is that we educate, educate our children, how it is that we educate our people. What is the framework through which we encourage people to be able to think and to approach? And when we reduce the broadness of that framework into very basic fundamentalist ways of thinking, we kill the text as a result of it. Um, I, do, I do think that, you know, Rabbi Sachs made that point, and it is one of, it is one of the key points of, of the book. Okay, so talk, talking about mindset, mm -hmm. in the third chapter, mm -hmm. um, which is called Dualism, and it's an important yeah. part of, of his entire theory, explaining the whole psychological process behind violence carried out by extremists, and everything is, it's, it's when everything is framed as good versus evil, us versus them. And we know it's a powerful and dangerous mechanism that 
extremists all use to justify their actions and, be, and enable them to cause such suffering on, on innocent people. And Rabbi Sachs argues this dualism is foreign to, to Judaism. It's incompatible with monotheism. Um, and Rabbi Sachs connects this to the power of identity, tribalism. Uh, maybe Rabbi Dweck, you'd like to talk a little about this and about dualism and whether such a paradigm is indeed incompatible with the Jewish mindset. Well, I'd like to be very clear. The difference between good versus evil is not a non-Jewish concept. It's a very Jewish concept. The entirety of Torah talks about it. I think what's important to understand in, in Rabbi Sachs' treatment is when he talks about dualism, he's talking about sources of reality. In other words, do I look at the universe as coming from one single source, and therefore everything in it ultimately finds its origins in that single source, or do I find it to come from two different sources, hence dualism? And the reason why he posits that people tend to gravitate towards dualism, at least moralistic dualism, meaning that I see that there is a good source and an evil source for the good and evil that comes into the world. That's, that's the important part, right? That's very important. It's not just that I don't believe in good and evil. Of course we believe in good and evil. We absolutely believe in good and evil. And it's a problem today, and this is Joe Dweck, not Rabbi Sachs. It's a problem today that we are afraid to use the word evil when we see it. The issue that Rabbi Sachs is pointing out is that the sources of good and evil are not dualistic. And there is, a, there is a prompt, there is a tendency among humanity, among human beings to look at the sources of good and evil as being dualistic. And that's mainly because it's so difficult for us to be able to reconcile how it is that we see the evil, atrocities, ugliness, in the world and still maintain our commitment and faithfulness to a monotheistic source, a single source of being. And so the easy way out of that, which doesn't take a tremendous amount of intellectual rigor, is to simply say, well, there aren't, there isn't one source, there are two. And once you do that, once you recognize that the sources of things are dualistic, then there's this question of which side you're on. And are you part of the light or are you part of the darkness? And if you're part of the light and not part of the darkness, well then, you know, it's a fight to, it's an epic eternal fight, you know, to, 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 get, away, to get at the evil and the darkness. And that is a major problem and something that, that Rabbi Sachs uh, writes about in that chapter. Um, I, I don't know that and the book, you know, has 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 a very specific focus, and it's quite um, um, economic in its use in its development of the ideas, right? So it's it's frugal, it's it's elegant, runs through. If I were to expect or want a a sequel to this book, I would want it to be based on that chapter, because it doesn't address the other question that is the outrider of the question of of duality. And that is, well, then how do you explain the evil and darkness and atrocity when you only deal with a monotheistic uh, creator? And the book doesn't do that, but that wasn't necessarily the aim of the book. The aim of the book was simply to say, this is why people act in the way that they do. Um, and so he's saying that, that that easily leads into a person's thinking, and this is another part of the argument, not necessarily in terms of the, the origins or the, the sources of these, of these manifestations in the world, that the dualistic thinking is not only in the origins, but also in terms of humanity itself. But that is more an evolutionary development in what uh, we would call tribalism. Right, and where we have a very deep-seated drive. Human beings have a very deep-seated drive to belong to a group because it's part of our security and survival. And we recognize that the more like we are and the more accepted we are by a group, the more secure we are. And when we recognize that security, we'll do anything in order to be able to ensure and, and maintain that security. And part of that security is recognizing that I am part of this group and you are not. 
And if you are not, you are a threat to my group unless you can show otherwise. And so that's something that's very, very deeply seated in all of us. And we all deal with, we all suffer from that, by the way, all of us, every single one of us deal with that. And it takes a tremendous amount of effort, conscious effort to be, first of all, aware of how deeply we, we, we think of it and, and deal with it. And I'm going to say to people that are, that are in here tonight, because you might be thinking, yeah, well, not me, you too. Everybody has it on one level or another. And, you know, for some of us, it might be subtle, but there is, it takes a great deal of consciousness to be able to go back into oneself and to be able to recognize genuinely these deep-seated drives that we have that create a tribalist uh, sense. Um, and we see, it, we see it throughout humanity. We see it in our own Jewish communities. We see it, we see it everywhere. And Rabbi Sachs highlights that in the book as being a major part of the, um, of the ability for people to be able to, to, to act in these violent ways uh, in, the name of, in the name of God. I mean, it always helps when you've got God on your side, you know, and that's, that's that quote that, that, that you were mentioning before, that Rabbi, that Rabbi Kata was mentioning before, that it's, once you've got God on your side, I mean, oh, you know, the performance of evil is just so wonderful because you just have the top, the top power on your end. So people give themselves full license to be able to perform evils that they otherwise would be more reticent to perform. Absolutely. Rabbi, Rabbi Kada. Yeah, you... I'll just add that um, this whole, like Rabbi Dweck said, if we were to have another sequel to this book, it would certainly be on, uh, on Judaism and Yichud Hashem. The Ramchal writes, whole dot were not is based on this idea that the whole purpose of creation is for us to recognize the Yichud Hashem, is the unity and the oneness and the monotheism of God. Um, and that's very difficult. Yeah. There's this cognitive dissonance that on the one hand, we're meant to believe in the one God. On the other hand, um, there's bad in the world. And it's far easier not to live a, a, a complex life. You know, it's far easier just to choose a side and not to worry about, and that's throughout life. There are so many things in life like that where people just prefer not to take the middle path a balanced path and just to take an extreme path because then you don't have to deal with complexities. Um, and that's the only aspect of God that we can understand. All the positive attributes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Er, Rahum, Hanun, Er, Chapayim, Hesed, Vehmed, all the positive attributes of God, these are not comprehensible for us human beings. The only thing which we can understand is, as it were, the negative aspect of God, that he's only one, that there aren't two. That's the only thing we can fully comprehend. And that for the Ramchal is the purpose of Briyat HaOlam is for us to recognize that Yichud Hashem, which Adam failed in. Um, and, and, like, and like we said, like I better said, actually, you know, this is something which we all struggle with, which is why on a daily basis, we're commanded twice a day, morning and evening, Shema Yisrael, Adonai and Adonai Yehad. Now, we don't need to remind ourselves so many times every day of our life that there's only one God. Well, we do need to remind ourselves there's only one power, there's only one force. Everything emanates from the same makor, from the same source, from the same Yichud Hashem, the same oneness and trinity of God. Um, and it's very, it's very easy to fall into the trap of just believing that there are two forces. It's interesting, Rabbi Kata, that you mentioned Shema Israel, because one of the reasons, you know, everybody will know that we say the second line, Baruch Shem Kevon Melchoto Le'olam Ba'id, quietly. One of the reasons that, that is given that we say it quietly is because to talk about God as being one is one thing, but to talk about his malchut, which is essentially the entirety of creation is all being an aspect of that unity is a whole nother level of understanding and awareness. And the reason we say it quietly is because we don't see it. So we say it because we recognize its truth to be ultimately true, but we don't see it in our perception. And so we say it quietly. And, uh, and, and that's an indication over the fact that this has always been a question and an issue uh, amongst us. And it's a, it's a valuable thing to be able to explore and to teach. So I encourage, I encourage the rabbis to be able to teach this more because it helps for us to be able to recognize the Yehud Hashem in a greater way. That's the whole thing with Yaakov and, uh, and Yosef when they meet each other. You know, when they meet each other and uh, they fall on each other's shoulders, and Yaakov is saying, Kirat Shema, Yosef isn't. Because Yaakov, he's only believed in the Yichud Hashem. He hasn't seen it manifested. 
For him, it's quiet. So now he's saying it. Ya- Yosef, though, he's seen the Yichud Hashem throughout the last 22 years. He recognizes everything God did, did was for a purpose. And so for him, he doesn't need to say Shema Yisrael. It's the same idea. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, so moving on, um, a lot of the book focuses, especially at the time, ISIS was at its height and um, on terrorism. And, and Rabbi Sachs writes about this tension, antagonism between, um, especially that exists today, between like radical Muslims and Jews. And, and he says it's rooted in this concept of sibling rivalry. Um, it's one of the main themes. And he argues that this notion is, is deeply embedded within our scripture. It's a dominant theme in the book of Bereshit. You have from the story of Cain and Hevel, Yitzchak Ishmael, of course, and all the way to Yosef and the brothers. Um, and then he speaks about role reversal in chapter eight. Again, another recurring theme in, in the narrative. When the tables are turned, think Yosef and, and, and the brothers. Rabbi Kada, would, would you like to uh, expand on any of these ideas? Take it however you want. Yeah, that was very powerful, that role reversal concept. Um, and Rabbi, Rabbi Sachs calls it the most profound moralizing experience is that of role reversal. And it's the most powerful resource against Judaism, which we've just talked about. So he brings the, the true story of a Hungarian politician, Shana Zagidi, who was a rising star in the Hungarian anti-Semitic party, Jobbik. And in 2012, he finds out his mother he finds out somehow that his mother had kept a secret that in fact he was a Jew. His maternal grandmother had been through Auschwitz um, and that had been concealed from his entire life. And that for him was a, a life changing moment because he had been uh, until now um, uh, out there as a politician for an anti Semitic party. And now he finds out that he himself is a Jew. And, and uh, Zagidi writes, you know, I was asked to apologize for the fact I'm a Jew. And like he said, I just can't understand that. Well, you know, I have to apologize for the fact my grandparents were burnt in Auschwitz. What's that got to do with me? And that totally changed his life. And fascinatingly, he ends up converting. And apparently now he's a religious Jew um, and is an, anti, an anti-racist an anti activist. And the reason this is so powerful is because this brings brings home this concept of us and them. It's so easy to fall into this trap of dualism that there's my tribe, my people, my community, the people that I'm associated with, we're the, we're the children of the light, everyone else is children of the darkness. Um, and that's the problem with morality. It, it binds and it blinds. It binds us together in our community, but it blinds us to everything outside our community, outside those who are similar to us. And the best way to be able to, to be cured of this potential um, antagonism towards people who are different to us is to imagine yourself as the other. Imagine being that other person, right? When you're forced to enter the, the humanity of the other person, then you start to recognize the other person isn't, you know, isn't a child of, of Satan. He's not a, a, a darkness. And lots of people say we're brought up in, in very closed uh, circles that, and they were unfortunately indoctrinated with unfortunate views about people who are not like them, right? Non Jewish people, non religious people. Then they meet these people and they start to have an association with them and they start to realize, wow, it's not reality what I've been taught. Um, actually, these are normal people. I'm, I, I identify with them. You know, that, that sense of role reversal and then that changes their whole landscape. Um, and the only way that a person can commit, in Rabbi Sachs' words, altruistic evil, which is the idea of pure evil for the sake of evil for, for, from a religious perspective, is because they categorize the other person as subhuman. Without the other person being subhuman, then you can't do this to achieve. You know, you're a religious person. When that person is no longer human, then I can commit that atrocity against him. But when you undergo role reversal, then you feel what it's like to be the other and you recognize, no, they're not subhuman. They're just as human as I am. And then a beautiful example of this in the Nevi'im is with uh, David HaMelech, the famous story. David HaMelech, he falls in love with Bacheva, and he sends Uriah Hiti to war, and David marries Bacheva. And Atana Navi comes and asks him, ostensibly, he's coming to ask him for advice. 
And he says, look, I have a question for you. You know, there's a rich man, there's a poor man in this town together, and the rich man, he's got flocks, he's got herds, he's got cats, everything he's got. The poor man's got one, one small lamb who he loves. And someone comes, and the rich person needs to uh, grant him some hospitality, and so he kills the poor person's sheep and offers that to the, to the, uh, to, 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 to the guest. And as this dialogue is, is, is happening, David is getting extremely angry. And then he ends up and he says, the one who did this deserves to die. And what does Nathan say back to him? Nathan says, yeah, that person is you, my friend. Right? You know, you, you, that's what you've done. With all your wives, you have to go and take Uriah Chiti's wife. That's the same. And David Amelech, he's got no words. Just one word, Hatati. I don't have anything to say to that. All I can say is that you're right. And I recognize now by going through this role reversal, I recognize that I was wrong. And that's why, you know, our Hachamin tell us is different versions, either 24, 36, or even 48 times, Tosfot holds. In 48 places, the Torah admonishes us not to disrespect, not to mistreat the ger, the stranger. And the Pasuk says in Parashat Mishpatim, this week's parasha, in fact, the Torah tells us, Do not oppress the ger. Remember, you yourself were strangers in Egypt. And for Rabbi Sachs, for him, he's, he's understanding that the whole purpose, one of the main purposes of going through Mitzrayim, going through Egypt, being a ger, being a convert, being a stranger, is so that when we begin and we build a new arm, a new people, a new land in Eretz Israel, we need to have experienced what it means to be a stranger, to be the other, and therefore never oppress the other. Recognize that the other is just as human as you are. He's different. He may have different, a different role in life. He may have a different covenant with God, but he's just as human as you are. And therefore, remember, Atem, you were one. That's why we're always reminded to remember. Zachor, 169 times memories mentioned. 160, Zachor, remember, don't forget. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but he takes, he takes the whole story of Yosef uh, with that. Now, the whole story of Yosef, Yosef is when he frames Binyamin um, and, and he asks for all the brothers to go home and Binyamin to stay. Essentially, what Yosef was doing was creating a controlled experiment to see whether the brothers have changed, putting them in that same situation which Yosef was in. Uh, will they do to Shuvah Gemara? Will they do complete repentance? Now they have a chance to sell their uh, uh, brother, Binyamin, um, just like they did before when they sold Yosef. Now they're feeling enslaved themselves, right? Um, they made Yaakov go through a grief of losing a son. Now they have to witness that grief again, but this time by no fault of their own. This whole aspect of, of putting themselves in another's shoes, that's what Yosef was trying to do to his brothers. And as soon as he sees that they've succeeded and that they don't fall to the, uh, they don't fall as they did at the beginning when they sold Yosef. And this time Yehuda is willing to step in in the stead of um, his brother Binyamin. Then Yosef is ready to reveal his identity uh, because that's the power of, of role reversal, the power of identifying with other people. So whenever we feel that someone else is so different to us and we feel that you know, they don't deserve our, our humanity, then try to think for a moment. What would they like being them? What's it like being brought like they are? It's very powerful. Yeah. Rabbi Dweck, do you have anything to add? Or? No, the only thing that I'll say about, about it is that is that he, Rabbi Sachs extrapolates that to the major religions, that, the, that Islam and Christianity and Judaism are essentially brothers. And that um, they are the Ab Abrahamic faiths, and so there is this sibling rivalry between between them, and that there has been this feeling, you know, historically anyway, less so with the Jews, really less so than the Jews with the Jews, but with the others, the other two, they they were hoping that you know everybody would kind of come onto their side, you know, Christians hoping that you know the founder of the of the faith was Jewish would be enough of an enticement. For everybody to come on board, and Islam having 
Jesus and Abraham and our patriarchs in there as being enough for everybody to come on board and, and, and thinking that everybody, you know, kind of just fall in line. That didn't happen. And there is, you know, that's, it's the same. It runs through the same of, being a, of, of seeing the world only in terms of either them or us. But that there was development. That the, at least between Jews and Christians, there after the Holocaust, there was development in where we were able to recognize the common humanity that we had. And it, and it allowed for those, those um, the ideals that drove the religious beliefs to be able to be seated and nested in the common humanity. Judaism is unique in that sense because Judaism was never a proselytizing religion. We, we never looked at the world as, as needing to be converted and that everybody had to fall in line. And so that makes a very, very big difference, um, which Rabbi Sack kind of underplays, but I do think that it's an important, an important thing to remember, that it's fundamentally different. I also think that it's important to remember that Judaism is very different from the other religions and that Judaism is not fundamentally a religion. We are fundamentally a nation. And, and that's why I was saying before that those discussions in our texts are national discussions, not religious discussions. And that is in a very important frame for, for reading it. I think that's a whole class in itself. Um, so I think connected to that is, the, I think he has one of the chapters where he talks about the chosen people. Um, it's like another component of, of the sibling rivalry and, and, and part of the tension is because of that. And, uh, and the question is, Rabbi, Rabbi Dweck, maybe you can carry on. How do we understand the universality of God in light of the Brit, of this covenant he has with Israel? that tension I, th I think by the universality you mean the fact that god is the god of all things and all peoples and how is it that there is this chosen group is that is that what you're yeah. referring to right so of course that's you know that's an issue that that that, that people have a great deal of difficulty with the the problem is is that when you have generic love which is essentially what a God of all peoples would have. In other words, it is a love for all things simply because they are, and not a love for individuals because of their individual uniqueness. That's missing. And real love, specific conscious love, is the love of an individual, qua the individual. And being that that is so, there is uniqueness involved in it. So God being the God of all things doesn't mean that God doesn't have unique and individualistic elements. So Rabbi Sachs goes in great detail to talk about the difference between the covenant of Noah and the covenant of Abraham, and that there is a God of humanity in which all beings, you know, all of these human beings are created in his image. And then there's the concept of his children, and they are not the same. And to me, although Rabbi Sachs alludes to it, but not directly, to me, the idea of a chosen people is an expression of God's commitment to unique individualistic love. So it is expressed in Israel as a very unique connection and covenant that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that God has with the Jewish people, but it also heralds to humanity that God is interested in unique and personal love, not just a generic platonic love of all things simply because things are. And that comes with a great deal of responsibility. It also, I mean, as it always does, I mean, real loving relationships always come with a great deal of responsibility. And the Jewish people have found that a very difficult thing to bear overall over the centuries, but we have. And so it's something that presents to the world a reality as far as God is concerned of specific attention, care, and love. And that's something that any human being can attain with God if they wish to. And that is exhibited in the uniqueness of the relationship with the Jewish people. Rabbi Kala, you wanna add anything on about that? 
Uh, no, I, I think that's, that's, that's exactly what I was actually saying, but uh, the only, the, the funny story to uh, illustrate this is the, the philosopher, I forgot his name, the philosopher who takes his philosophy students to um, restaurants and um, wants to have some soup with them. And so he sits down with them and the waiter comes and the waiter asks, you know, what soup do you want? And he says, soup. And he says, yeah, I've got chicken soup. I've got vegetable soup, I've got lentil soup, I've got tomato soup. Which soup do you want? And this philosopher answers, soup. All right, you know. And I don't know if the waiter gets the, gets the joke at the end or not, but the point is, is that that's platonic soup. You know, there has to be, we are, we inescapably have an identity. We inescapably, um, love has to be directed to someone. You can't just have love for everyone and love for all soup. What soup do you want? You have to specify. And so that's part of it. You know, there is God's love for Am Yisrael, but there's also his breed of Noah with all of, all of humanity, uh, Jews and non-Jews alike. That um, That's a different kind of breed. But the breed of love, the breed of chosenness, that's unique for Am Yisrael. So I think we've got 10 minutes um, to take a few questions. If anyone wants to raise their hand and then we can unmute you um, or you can put a question in the chat box. I've received one anonymously, but um, okay. So Simon Montague asks, how could God call us the chosen people when he knows the kind of situation Yaakov triggered among the brothers by preferring Yosef over his brothers? Anyone want to take that? So we've seen what that led to. Look, I think Rabbi Sachs himself addresses this in the book. Bni Bechori Israel. We're called Bni Bechori Israel. Am Yisrael are called the firstborn people. But that's the point that there has to be someone taking the lead. Chosen people isn't a right, it's a responsibility. It's not that we are uh, demanding things because we are chosen. On the contrary, uh, because we are chosen, we have special we have special um, special functions, special roles in this world. We are an ambassador for God for the rest of the for the rest of the world. We're Orla Goyim, and so God chooses. This is Rabbi Sachs makes this point a number of times in the book. God chooses the one who's not naturally the stronger. Um, so, for example. Akadosh Baruch Hu chooses Yaakov. He chooses um, Yitzhak as opposed to Ishmael. Yaakov is the Ishtam, the Yoshevo Halim. He's the simpleton sitting in the tents. Yaakov is the strong one, Ishtzaid. God naturally identifies with the weaker. And Am Yisrael, going through their persecution, he identifies with them and says, these are the people who have been persecuted, who are the weaker, who need my covenant, who need my love. Um, and so when you see it in, in those terms, again, we have to be careful. When, when God chooses, he doesn't reject, right? That's the mistake Yaakov makes. When he loves, when Yaakov loves Rachel, gamet Rachel he loves Rachel more than Leah, which is fine. You know, a person can naturally love one person more than another, but you have to make it clear to the other person that he's not rejected. And that's the whole point of section two of Rabbi Sachs' book, is that when God, when, when God is choosing one brother over the other, he's not rejecting the other. When he's choosing Amri he's not rejecting the other. He's choosing them for a, a, a role. And their role is to be an ambassador. And he's chosen Amri specifically because seemingly of our intrinsic weakness. And he needs us to be able to, well, I, I'm not sure about that, but uh, he's chosen us as a, as, a, as a responsibility, not as a right. Yeah, sorry, I, I made a mistake. So Simon asks, um, can an individual of any nation fully realize his or her potential of having a loving relationship with God from within their own nation without becoming Jewish? Yes. It's a halakha mefureshet, Simon. It's an explicit halakha. In fact, I will read you the halakha. It is a halakha that our Rambam is posek. At the end of Hilchot Shemitah Yovel, and he says 
the following. Listen carefully. Kol ish ve'ish, mikol ba'eh ha'olam, any person from all people on earth, asher nadevaru ho'oto, that his spirit moved him, ve'vino mada'o, and his knowledge brought him to an understanding, lihibadel la'amod lifnei Adonai l'shareto, to set himself apart and to serve God, l'de'at Adonai, to know God, ve'halach yashar k'mo she'asa'u ha'elohim, and he continued to living a straight life as God had made him. And he throws off of his shoulders the yoke of all these other things that people bother themselves with. That person becomes holy of holies. And God is his portion. And it is his portion for always, forever. And that person will get in this world what it is that he needs. Just as was done to the Levim and the Kohanim. Notice, it doesn't say that he has to become Jewish. It simply says that he has to live his life dedicated to God without any other ulterior motives. And that person has a relationship with God. So that's Halakha. One of the anonymous questions sent in privately um, is when you were talking, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Dweck, about, about evil, um, are not all perceptions of evil subjective? And does Rabbi Sachs deal with this at all? I don't think that Rabbi Sachs deals with it. But that is true, that e good and evil is a personal judgment. The problem is, is that what, what people don't recognize is that there are deeper elements to good and evil, existential elements to good and evil that are viable and non-viable. And Harambam talks about this in the second chapter of the first Helik of the Morin Nebuchim. It's a very well-known chapter and where he talks about the difference between true and false and good and evil. And it is absolutely possible that our morality or our moral judgments, meaning our judgments of what is good and what is evil, can be completely divorced from what is true and what is false, or from what is viable and what is not viable. And, uh, and the reason for that is because we can decide realities based on our own minds and our own judgment without necessarily caring about how those things play out in reality of, that is objective outside of us. Much of the reason for that is because it takes too long for us to figure out what the ultimate outcomes of, of, of the choices we make or the acts that we perform will yield. But it is important to recognize, and Torah certainly prompts us to recognize, that true good must always be tethered to truth. Or in, if you embed truth in time, what is viable? What is viable means what will ultimately work out and be successful and survive in the most whole sense, on the on broadest and most robust levels. And that evil essentially is tethered to what is false or non-viable or what will cause destruction and counterproduction. In English, interestingly, we have two terms that are used inter interchangeably for truth and good and for false and evil. And if you think about it, we cannot use those terms interchangeably, right? You don't use true and good interchangeably. So two plus two equals four is a true statement. It's not a moral thing. It's not a good statement. It's a true statement. When you talk about giving charity, that's a very good thing to do. It's not a true thing. It's a good thing. We don't use those in our vernacular interchangeably. But in English, there are two terms that we use for both of those elements interchangeably, and those terms are right and wrong. So if two plus two equals four, that's right. That is right. And giving charity is the right thing to do. And the reason why we have those terms, uh, interestingly in English, is that it's sensitive to the fact that our moral judgment should be tethered to existential objective realities. I think Rabbi Kada will ask um, if you can answer Zach's question. How do we deal with the issues regarding Lotefanem? Do not show the mercy, praising. Um, surely this, these halachot enable issues of Jewish fundamentalism. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, it's a hard text. It's a hard text. But again, you know, like we said at the beginning, 
um, you need to interpret. You, know, you can't go from a relation to application without interpretation. And I'll say two things about this. The first thing I'll say is, is the Me'iri, the famous Me'iri, who says that all mentions of Akum in the, in, in the Gemara is always referring to an idol worshiper. An idol worshiper, one who rejects God or rejects the unity of God, which would certainly exclude Islam and according to many would exclude Christianity as well. Despite their belief in Shituf, their belief in the Trinity, it doesn't, they still believe in a certain sense of, of unity of God. Um, and so for Meiri, all these halakhot about, uh, like you said, about not to, khonem, not to show them mercy, not to give them grace, not to heal them, all these kinds of things um, are referring specifically to an Ovet Kochavim and not uh, just a person who doesn't share our faith. So that substantially limits the, the range of, of, of people affected by this. And the second thing I will say is, to, again, why I mentioned earlier on, to take into account context. Remember, this is being written during Roman times when Israel are under great pressure from the Romans. There are, they are being persecuted by them. And you have, do have to bear in mind whether that has, that has a bearing on, on these drashot. You know, that's something to bear in mind for sure, at least. That taking into account the way they viewed the, the Romans around, the people around them, that this was what they, uh, this is how they understood the Pesukim. Um, but whether that's open for reinterpretation today, I would humbly suggest that there is a, there is a, there is, a, there is room for that. Robert, right? Yeah, I mean, I hear that. I think that also it's important to understand that there's a difference between simple simply looking at other, and it does, it has to do with the framework of the text, understanding what the text is talking about, and enemies. Enemies that we did not simply decide were enemies because we decided to decide that they were enemies, but because of actions that were done against us. And so it, it is wonderful to say, turn the other cheek, but that's not a Jewish idea. It is important to be able to recognize that there are dangers in the world, and there are dangers in social situations. And so there are prompts in Torah to caution us around those dangers. And that is the principle. And that's how essentially these kinds of texts need to be read. Not that, listen, these people are evil. Make sure you eradicate them. There's always a sense of animosity and danger coming from the other side that we, that we have to protect ourselves against. And that's how really it's supposed to be seen. And where that is not ready or where is that, that, that is not present, even with Amalek, well, then the issues don't apply. So in order for, you know, as the Gemara says, if you have grandchildren of Haman learning Torah and B'nai Berak, well, somebody missed a trick somewhere because weren't we supposed to kill them on site? No, we were not supposed to kill them on site. There are, there are, there's war and there's insurgents and there's danger and there's enemies and there is war and that is normal and that is real and that is part of humanity. And for us to pretend that that is not part of humanity is naive and dangerous, but it does not then uh, warrant tr being translated into being bloodthirsty and uh, self-righteous. Beautiful. Um, I think time is up. And as Esther says, just love to thank the panel for an interesting and inspirational seminar. Always a pleasure to speak with Rabbi Kada and to have these wonderful conversations with you all in the audience. And thank you, Avi, so much for the wonderful uh, mod moderating and, and keeping us in, on track. It's, it's, it's always a pleasure to be able to do that. And thank you for, for doing it with us. Thank, thank you, Rabbi Zek, for joining us for a really interesting conversation. And I'm sure I myself enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone else also did. And Avi for moderating it so well. Just, just one thing, next week, um, we look forward to seeing you all. We'll be going through a Teshuvah, I think, with Rabbi Kada, um, inside of the Meiri, talking about the Meiri, where, you know, about the medieval um, controversy about the Rambam and um, philosophy and science and, and the ban that there was for under 25s. So definitely come and join, learn more about the, the controversy and uh, that raged through the Middle Ages. So. We look forward to uh, having you all. Thank you so much and uh, Laila Tov.
It's an, just to add one point, it's an excellent uh, follow on from today because this is in fight, in fighting tribalism within Am Israel, how we got to that fighting amongst the camps. And this is a good follow on from tonight's, uh, tonight's session. All the best, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi Joy. Call to everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Abby. No problem. See you next week. Bye, Daniel. Bye, Tommy.